Uh, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Who would like to open prayer? Volunteer? Miguel, would you? Uh -huh. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to study your word and meditate upon the words of Jesus. Help us to understand uh, this text and to learn from it uh, the way to eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We have this, um, by the way, if any of you ever wonder why I have this color-coded thing, it's just, I, when I do podcast, I quickly color-code it for showing people where verbs and participles and, and nouns and so it's not, it's not my cheat sheet, it's just because I have done this for the podcast a week or two ago. Um, and um, our focus, uh, obviously, with Easter 5, shifts a little bit. You see this in the, um, the lectionary. Uh, Good Shepherd Sunday, Easter 4, always a John text. And typically, no matter what series you're in, Easter 5, 6, leading up to Pentecost, are also John text. Because of the, the focus in John, especially that they're drawn from the farewell narrative on the coming of the Spirit. So there is a little bit of a shift, and I mentioned this last week, with Easter 4. Is instead of focusing on the resurrection appearances, you have the theme of Jesus shepherding the church during the Easter season, that's Easter 4. And then you have the emphasis of Jesus' physical departure and his ongoing presence through the Spirit being the focus in these last couple of weeks before Pentecost. And uh, that's true, obviously, this week, because we're focusing on Jesus' departure. You know, he's speaking about, it's from the farewell narrative, but it's obviously preparing the disciples for following his death, following his 40 days of resurrection appearances, he's going to be ascending. In John, there isn't the focus so much on, on 40 days, but the emphasis is he's going to the Father. So once he is, once he's done with his... Um, his sacrifice, and once he rises, he's always talking about going to the Father. Um, and that's, one might say, the way in which the ascension is spoken of in John. Uh, in Matthew, or in, and especially in Luke, uh, you have that strong emphasis of, you know, of the focus on ascension. Uh, but in John, it's simply, he's, he's in this mode, <laughs> once he is risen, He's in this process of going to the Father. The other Gospels give you the timeline of 40 days, uh, then the Ascension, and 50 days, and then uh, Pentecost. Any other questions just in terms of why, how this fits in the lectionary? And why don't we uh, at least read a couple of verses uh, to get the, the text started. So um, uh, why don't we start right here with... Um, Nathaniel, why don't you read verses 1 and 2 and translate for us? Me tara sesto humon e cardia, pistuita eis tonta on, kai eis a me pistuita. En te oikia tu patras mu, manai polai eisen, e de me, epon an humin, pati poruamai, etoi masai top on humin. Do not let your heart be disturbed. Believe in God and believe in me. In the house of my father are many rooms. Um, and uh, if not, um, if not, I would have said to you that I am journeying to prepare a place for you. Well, it's a question, so you um, would just, if not, I would. If not, mm -hmm. if not, I would have said. I would not have said. I would not have, yeah, if not, I would have said. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to prepare. If not, would, would I have said. Would I have said, said that? Yeah. Said. Okay. <laughs> no, it's a question. If not, would I have said this? Obviously, uh, it's because I said this, because it is true. I'm, so it's a contrary to fact. Well, excuse me, I shouldn't ask that question. What kind of what kind of sentence is verse two? Is it uh, contrary to fact? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and why? Uh, what what tells you that it's contrary to fact, Nathaniel? The uh, the a and then the on. 
educates better. Yeah, you have in the um, in the Pratasis you have an, an A or an I, the epsilon yoda, which is the if statement, and then in the uh, second half, the apodosis, you have the verb, ipon, plus an on. Whenever you see that on, you're thinking, okay, I have to add the, the term would in English, and I have to translate it as a contrary to fact. So if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going uh, to prepare a place for you? Uh, obviously... Why is Jesus, I mean, we're kind of jumping into the farewell narrative here. Why is Jesus starts off with this, this verb? And if you parse, um, uh, uh, you have taras sesto. Um, mm -hmm. how, would you, how would you parse that? It's a present <coughs> imperative active third person singular. Yeah. So <coughs> the present imperative is used with may. So what kind of command is this? Um, an ongoing? Yeah, with a negative command, it's either, um, it's talking about, does anybody remember the distinction between may plus the aorist subjunctive and may plus the present imperative? This is with negative commands. Does anybody remember the distinction? Do not and stop. Yes. Okay. So, if you have the may plus a present, excuse me, an aorist subjunctive, that's speaking about don't in the future. But if you have may plus the present imperative, like this, like in the, the Easter you know, uh, greetings, uh, stop fearing, uh, you have may plus the present imperative, that's a negative command given because people are already engaged in the behavior. So these disciples already have hearts that are troubled. <coughs> so in a sense, he's not saying... Uh, don't let your hearts get troubled in the future. He's basically saying, <laughs> stop letting your hearts get troubled. Why? Because they are already troubled. Why are they troubled? What's the setting here? Jesus is he's talking about what? He, they're in the upper room, so he's preparing them for his arrest, crucifixion. Yeah. And he's talking about the fact that he's going to be leaving them. You know, chapter 13 already introduces this theme. So they're... They're, they're concerned about the fact that he's been talking about his death, you know, uh, laying down his life. He's been talking about now even leaving them. So they're naturally, you know, here's their master. Uh, I like to, to, to put the, um, I, I draw this analogy, is we can call John 13 through 17 Jesus' last will and testament. So if if you've ever been in a room, as you will as a pastor, with somebody who's dying, they often want to talk about certain things and, and express them, like to their family members or to their pastor, before they die. Um, my father knew he was dying, and so you know I spent time with him, and so I'm very, you know, emotionally resonate. I've also been with members who have been with family members close to death, and if they're they're alert, they want to say certain things. They want to kind of, in a sense, get, get finished what they want to say so that when the Lord calls them, they're ready to go. Uh, and so this is Jesus' sort of last will and testament. These are what he's talking about, leaving. He's talking about uh, their, uh, the things that are of importance for, for them and their mission. He also makes sure that they know that he's not going to leave them alone. He's going to send the Spirit. So this business about uh, he's comforting them even before his death. <laughs> he's comforting them even before his ascension. Mm -hmm. uh, and the whole business of stop letting your hearts be troubled um, and uh, believe in God, believe also in me. What do you make of that phrase, Nathaniel, where it's, it's first of all, pistoite, well, what kind of uh, parse that for us? It's present, Im present imperative. Now there you can make more out of the, uh, the grammar. We would think usually of aorist imperative. Why would Jesus, why would John record Jesus' command here as a present imperative? So is that more of an ongoing? Yeah, thing? yeah. Believe now and continue to believe. It's not, it's not like uh, believe this week and don't worry about it later. Uh, it's focusing on sort of an ongoing policy command 
believe and continue to believe. What do you make about the fact that he says believe in God and believe in also in me? That Kai can be understood as, as translating, can be translated also. What does he mean by that? Believe in God, believe also in me. Anyone? What does he mean by that? Is he saying that he is equal to God? Yeah. He's saying faith in the God of Israel is also faith in me. Why? Because I'm the visible Yahweh. Uh, I'm the visible image of Yahweh. To believe in me is not to believe in somebody other than the God of Israel. And so, remember, he said several times, I and the Father are one. He said that earlier. Uh, he's emphasized before Abraham was, ego I, me, I am. So, this kind of language, believe in God, believe also in me, is very monotheistic. It's not like you're... you're you're sinning against the, the faith in the one God of Israel if you're believing in Jesus. Matter of fact, you're being faithful to, to who the God of Israel is by believing in Jesus. Um, and he's not, I mean, you would think uh, this is sort of, a, this would be blasphemy unless Jesus was truly Yahweh. For, for him to say, believe in me. This isn't, uh, this isn't him saying, sort of, uh, have religious faith in the, uh, the God of Israel, but sort of trust also that I'm, believe in me as in uh, trust in me. Sort of like a, um, uh, a boyfriend might say to a girlfriend, you know, believe in me, you know, have faith in what I'm going to do for you. <laughs> this, is, this is Jesus saying, trust in, in the God of Israel, and in the same way, trust in me. Why? Because I am none other than that God of Israel. Yeah, I'm the visible image of that God of Israel. Uh, and then this language of, uh, and you're going to use this a lot, especially in what kind of settings? This passage. Funeral? Yeah, funeral or helping people who have just or lost helping. a loved one or helping people who are facing death. In my father's house there are many rooms that were not so I would have told you. And so just as maybe people are, are struggling with facing death themselves or are struggling with having just faced the death of a loved one, uh, the words of Jesus to his apostles resonate. You know why? Because he's saying, don't worry guys, I'm not just abandoning you. I'm actually going ahead and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And in my father's house, in many rooms, what is that image for? That, uh, you always hear this, that uh, you know, uh, the mansions of, of heaven are greater than the, mo the, the mansions of this world. There's more rooms in there. <laughs> but you know, what's, the, what's the real image? What's the real theological thrust of this image of many rooms? Anyone? I think... Um... Weinrich likened this to the crucifixion itself. Okay. And so I go to prepare a place for you by going to the cross. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think one can say that's part, the way he goes to the Father is through the cross. Mm -hmm. But I think this understanding of leaving him is not just going to the cross, it's continuing on the trajectory of cross, resurrection, ascension. and then ascension to the Father. Now, his focus most of the time in teaching is not about the ascension to the Father. You know, it's lifting up on the cross. But here in, in the farewell discourse, he starts talking more beyond the cross to going to the Father. And then of coming to be with them through the Spirit. You know, it's not like he sends the Spirit and he's not present anymore. He's present through the Spirit. The Spirit, in a sense, brings the presence of Jesus to us. Um, through sacrament, through uh, the, the agency of the word, the means through the word, and, and through the sacraments. But uh, so he even will say, "I'm coming to you," and he's speaking about sending the Spirit. Why is he coming? I thought he was leaving. Well, he's coming through the Spirit, testifying to him. He will continue to be present, but he's present in a different way. He's not present, flesh and blood, sitting one place here on earth. He's present wherever the word of God is proclaimed and wherever the sacraments are celebrated. Uh, but this image of many rooms, I think, is it's, it's just 
you know, how many of you grew up? I grew up with three brothers. You know what I did for all, my whole my whole life? Share room. <laughs> share room, share bed. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, it was real close. You know, close knit uh, type of uh, close communion. You know? <laughs> but what's the image here? There are many places. There's many rooms, and so each each one of the followers of Jesus, each one of his sheep, has a place in in in. Uh, in God's house, and it's, uh, so it's just it's a comforting. I, I think it's sort of one might say uh, a comforting image of election. It's just like we hear our our name is written in the book of life. Uh, we are assured there's there's a place for us after death and, and in resurrection. It's uh, it's not like, um, and I also think it it uh, helps point to this theme that we are we are pilgrim people. You know that because there is a sense where we always feel like we're on a journey, and we're never, you know, even though we have some nice homes here or we have some wonderful spots where we serve, we're, we're never quite settled in. We're sort of always pilgrim people, and especially when you're a pastor, you sense that. You know, you're, you're kind of. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, and then I was a pastor in Michigan. I've, I've never lived any place longer now than Fort Wayne. I lived in Wisconsin 21 years, <laughs> lived in Michigan 11 years, and I've been in Fort Wayne 21 years. You can do the math and see how old I am. But add in a few years uh, going to school in Fort Wayne. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, we are pilgrims. We're, we're uh, sort of moving uh, from here and fro. And here the, the assurance is there's a final place where we'll be in communion with God and it's it, that Jesus is prepared. And it's not like we're sort of left as orphans. So I think this, inf this image of God's house in many rooms is simply the assurance that uh, um, what we have here and the fellowship that we enjoy with, um, with Jesus is not the end. There's an even greater um, establishment of fellowship and communion that we'll, we'll experience immediately upon death, but especially in the resurrection. Um, any questions on anything? Uh, this business of going to prepare a place for them, so it's not just that Jesus is leaving and you know, kind of turning the reins over to them, but he actually has more plans for them, and that's to bring everybody through their earthly pilgrimage to to the Father's house. Um, and uh, it's, you know, we can say to tell us die, the work of Christ is done, but it's really not. He still has to bring us through this pilgrimage. And, and the work of Christ, of saving us, is done, but the work of Him actually restoring all of creation won't be done until the last day. Um, so, you know, I've emphasized this a few times, many of you have heard this, this shtick, but there's a past tense of salvation, we have been saved through Christ's death. There's a present tense, we are being saved, why? He's nurturing us in the faith through the word and sacraments. And we will be saved on the last day. There's a future tense of salvation. And that's what's being emphasized here, you know, that he will bring us to the to many, uh, house of many rooms. Okay, let's keep going. Um, and why don't we just translate away here? I mean, just, yeah, translate verses 3 and 4, Brian. And if I go, and I will prepare a place for you, uh, again coming and take, take you to myself, uh, so that where I am, uh, you might be also. And where I go, uh, oh, um, you know uh, the way mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where I go. Yeah, yeah. So, what kind of sentence is being introduced with uh, in verse three with the et on? Um, like your um, conditional sentences, wise. Yeah, I'm asking the question. <laughs> no, I'm just verifying the, the, yeah. the question. Yeah. Um, if I go and will prepare a place for you again. 
Could this be a future more vivid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you have the emphasis um, of I am coming again and I will um, para lamesomai. There you have the future tense. Um, to, to take you to be with me so that where I am, you will also be. Uh, so you have that, that emphasis uh, in the henna clause is just explaining what, what's, how does the henna clause function here. Like a purpose clause. Yeah, yeah. It's expressing the purpose for him coming again to take them where, where uh, <coughs> um, to be with himself. So the emphasis here, what is what event is Jesus obviously talking about here? Uh, you know, he's first of all going to go away and prepare a place where he will come again. What's 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 uh, the time frame here? What, what is it? The second coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and one can say, in a sense, for for many of us, this may not this coming to take us to be with him. Uh, is preceded by the fact that we may physically die. So he may gather us to his presence before his second coming. But all of us, body and spirit and self, will be brought into his presence on the last day. And that's the primary focus of what he's talking about here. is coming for all of creation, coming for all of his children, and bringing us so that where he is, namely as the risen, glorified Lord, we will be also as risen, glorified human beings. Uh, but obviously we can also interpret this and certainly comfort people with the assurance that at the moment we die, we are brought into uh, Christ's presence uh, and uh, we await you know, the resurrection of our body, but we experience in a sense, being in communion with Christ and the saints immediately upon death. Today you will be with me in paradise, Jesus told the, the thief on the cross. He didn't say, when I come back again on the last day, then you're going to start experiencing paradise. He said, today. Um, so the understanding, obviously, of communion with God is the essence of paradise. We experience that immediately upon death, but paradise really climaxes with the restoration of creation with God true Garden of Eden experience. It's interesting, the term paradise in the Septuagint uh, is the same term used for Eden in the Septuagint. <coughs> so, today you will be with me in paradise. It's like saying, today you will be with me in Eden. Uh, in the sense of, uh, what's the essence of Eden? The essence of Eden is having fellowship with a God without sin. Uh, and obviously, part of that uh, will be the restored creation of your body and resurrection and the rest of creation restored. Any other questions in terms of what Jesus is... So, what does he mean by you know the way? Tan hodon. Um, they know him. Okay. Um, and... What do you think this is maybe playing off of? What, what, would, what do you think Jews would the average Jew would think about the way, the term hodon, what would be the way to God? For Let's just say your average Jew, your average Pharisee. Well, not Jerusalem, right? Okay. Uh, following Torah would be part of the path. It's almost like, you know, I've mentioned this a few times, you're part of the people of God because you are elected by grace, but then you, how do you how do you stay on this path that the Lord's put you on? Well, part of what a lot of Jews thought is obedience to Torah. Okay? So Torah was seen as the way to stay on this path that leads to eternal fellowship with, with the God of Israel. And I think Jesus is actually contrasting how some Jews think the way to God. Hmm. They, would put, they would put the obedience to Torah as playing a role. Now Jesus wants sanctification. Let's not ever speak against sanctification. Sanctification is important. Jesus says, if you're attached to me, you're going to bear much fruit. Okay? That's John 15. That comes in the next chapter. You know, Jesus is concerned about sanctification and fruit, but he's not, he's concerned about not confusing sanctification as the way in which we um, have eternal fellowship with God. 
it's not, we shouldn't put it in a soteriological role. Um, and, and so the way is not Torah, except that Torah reveals a gracious God who is none other than the Son, who is acting in our salvation. And if we're viewing Torah as obeying Torah as the key way to have eternal fellowship with God, we're missing the point of what Torah is revealing. The instruction in Torah is not, this is what you need to do to stay on the path, stay on the way to, to salvation. It's, it's about revealing what God has done for us to bring us salvation. And along the way of that gracious gift, we are to live out the life that he has called us to live. But it's not the basis for, you know, uh, for being able to, to uh, um, uh, receive that, that, uh, that. It's not the way in which we receive that um, eternal fellowship with God. Okay, let's, uh, and, and obviously this opens up the question in verses 5 and 6. Jeff, you want to translate? <clears throat> so Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you go. How are we able to know the way? Okay. Uh, this is the perfect question. Yeah. Why, why, why does uh, Thomas uh, ask this question? You know, in the sense of, of uh, how does this fit with the wider narrative? You don't hear from individual disciples that yeah, much in the Gospel of John. How does this, I mean, this... When you're preaching this, this kind of fits a little bit because we've already heard from heard Thomas at Easter too. Yeah. yeah. How does it fit here? There's kind of that doubtful sense to Thomas here. He's been following <coughs> Jesus for these past three years or so. And Jesus has been showing him who he is, the way. And as you said earlier, Jesus may be playing on that contrast to Torah. Yeah. And now Thomas, but we don't know. Yeah. And so it, it's kind of a... You, you have both Thomas and Philip in this narrative um, showing some real questions, questions that allow Jesus to teach. But, but they are, you know, one might say, just as Thomas uh, struggled with, you know, unless I put my hand in... And I know people have tried to... Tried to... Um, what? Redeem Thomas a little bit. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, uh, a person in studying John 20 that says there's two paradig paradigmatic disciples. There's the beloved disciple who goes to the tomb, who looks in, doesn't see the body of Jesus and believes. He's the paradigm for what we are to do. To, to, see, to see an empty tomb and yet believe Jesus is alive. Thomas is the paradigm for I need to see the flesh and blood Jesus before I believe. And there's a negativity to that in the sense of we should believe without seeing the physical Jesus before us. Why? Because we have the testimony, destroy this body, in three days it will be raised. We, we need to trust what Jesus has said um, and, and that uh, even though we may not see him as you know, anybody after the 40 days of appearances, we aren't, none of us are going to see the risen Christ. We trust. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the beloved disciple. We see the testimony of the empty tomb. We see even the testimony through the scriptures to the risen Christ, but we don't actually see the risen Christ. We have to believe on the basis of the word. Uh, and, uh, and I think Thomas just as an example, uh, just as Philip is in this narrative of not getting it, but it gives Jesus an opportunity. Uh, and that happens a lot of times. Nicodemus doesn't get it. Gives us an opportunity. Gives Jesus an opportunity to teach. Samaritan woman doesn't get it. Gives Jesus an opportunity to teach. Thomas here, you know, we don't know where you're going. Well, he's talking about going to the Father. <laughs> okay? I mean, where is the Father? <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it is, you know, uh, one might say it's part of our own limitations, and it's sort of an honest question, and it gives Jesus a chance to teach. Here, a uh, quick question about this in terms of the audience that that John is, I guess, keeping in mind here. That could this be a 
message to the Jews that hear this that think, what do you mean? You have the Torah, and thinking, um, and, and then having them be corrected when Jesus says that he, that, he, that um, uh, when he says that he, uh, man, that okay. he is the way. Yeah. So like, so in that sense, it's not just a teaching moment for Thomas, but it's also a teaching moment for those who hear. And you might have a certain thing in mind, and then they'll say, oh, okay. Yeah, and one might say, <clears throat> even if we don't, you know, later on you have Jews, you don't have Jews, you have other people. Like in our culture, if, uh, if you were to say to a you know, 21st century American that, uh, well, Jews believe that the Torah was the way, they'd say, no, we don't, you know, we never thought that, you know, we're 21st century Americans. But what do they think? They think, uh, I, I'll find my own way uh, to, to God, and obviously part of my own way is actually quite connected to what the Jews. Right. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be a kind person. I'm trying to, to you know, really treat my, my uh, neighbor as, as he would want to be treated. And so, wouldn't <clears throat> God look on that as, as well, that's the same, <laughs> same kind of understanding of confusing sanctification and giving it the soteriological role. The only way to God, as Jesus has said, you know, I'm the gate. It set it up. Remember, we talked about this last week. This sets up the whole text. I'm the gate. You know, if you enter through me, you, you'll be able to come in and go out and find pasture. Uh, and this really sets up this language of I am the way, the truth. There's only one way to fellowship with God now and for all eternity, and that's through faith in Jesus, through what he has done through his death and resurrection. Um, Jeff, next verse, verse 6. Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Not one comes to the Father if not through me. Of these three, what would you say is the most prominent um, image for Jesus? You know, usually we just have, I am the light, or I am the bread of life, or I am the door. Here you have three. I would latch on to truth, I think, okay. going through the narratives of John. What's your textual basis, you know, in this context? Um, because, oh... Well, in this, in this context, I would say way. Okay. In this context, I would say And I would say, and you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's, um, I was trying to be real pastoral. Yeah. <laughs> We're good. This is, this is Good Shepherd Pastoral Week, so mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm leading you. I'm not, you know, I'm not prodding you. <laughs> to tie in with the sermon I just preached. Yeah. <laughs> in this context, I would go with way. Yeah, I mean, and honestly... Way. It fits this way. We already, we, we do have in the context this emphasis on truth. Uh, John chapter 8, mm -hmm. you know, the truth will set you free. You also have this emphasis on life. We see it actually right before it. I am the resurrection, resurrection and the life. life. But the real focus here is on way and what other text right after this tells us this. Not only the fact that he's emphasized way, he's answering the question, we don't know, you know, the way you are going. But what does he say right after this that helps us to understand that the, the major thrust of this statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is actually, I am the way. What does he say? Anyone? No one comes to the Father. Yes. Not through me. Yes, yes. Udais, no one comes to the Father through me. That's emphasizing not the point that he is the life, not the point that he's the truth, but he's the, he's the way. way. Yeah. And um, so even though there's three, and all of them are wonderful, yeah. all of them are rich, uh, that really the primary thrust in this statement is, I am the way. And if he would have just said that, that's really the, the primary thing. Why does he add, add on the truth and the life? Because in a sense, these are images also for Torah. The Torah was seen as the truth. Where do you find truth in the Torah? Where do you find life? Life, uh, life is found in the Torah. Jesus is basically using all three, but the primary image is way uh, for himself. He, uh, 
Think of that, that famous psalm, he even quotes it in John 17, uh, sanctify us in truth, your, your word, word your word is truth. And what he's basically saying, if we're looking at the Torah and we're not seeing him, we're miss and we're actually saying the Torah is truth because it reveals the way I, I have to live in order to please God, we're missing the major point of what Torah reveals. It reveals what God has done for us in the Son, graciously you know, delivering and rescuing us in salvation. Um, and, and in a sense, truth is not just something found in the Word. Truth is the person revealed in the Word. And that's interesting, especially with the term waka, sanctify us in truth. Your word, not just the Bible, but your word, your logos, is truth. Namely, Jesus as the word is the embodiment of truth. Okay, so you have this emphasis, and I am the way. You know, and again, this follows up very nicely with the image that we saw in John 10. Jesus is the gate, the way to access for fellowship with, in the flock of God, fellowship with the one God of Israel. It's through Jesus. He's the only access point. There aren't many ways to fellowship with God. Pick your religion, pick your flavor, 39, you know, um, 39 uh, Baskin Robbins, you know, flavors of ice cream. Just go and, and do the spiritual, you know, ice cream bar and pick it out. Now, this, Jesus is speaking very exclusively. And uh, somebody that, that says, hey, you know, all that's important is that you have true faith. You, have, you believe in something. This is baloney. You know, uh, you, you have God's revelation emphasizing that there is one God and that there is one way to salvation. And one of the key differences with man-made religions is the role that man plays in appeasing God or in attaining salvation. You know, one of the unique aspects of Christianity, as opposed to every other world religion, is the emphasis of grace alone. It's, it's God's action that's the basis for our relationship with God. Uh, you know, our merit and our, our worthiness, our actions, really are not the basis. I mean, they're the basis for sanctification, but they're not the basis for our salvation. Any questions? And then that very exclusive, if not through me, no one comes to the Father if not through me. And, you know, we can translate, I may accept. In, in, mm -hmm. literally, literally, it's if not through me. I'm, he's the only, the exclusive way of salvation. Verses 7 and 8, please. Miguel? Uh -huh. uh, if you had known me, mm -hmm. uh, you would also have known my Father. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Um, okay, and let's pause there. What kind of sentence is found in seven? And I think he translated it well, but what would you expect in the structure of the sentence? Well, first of all, you know it's a conditional. You have yeah, it's a, it's a what, contrary to fact. Yeah, but you would expect what in the second half in the apodosis? Oh, an? An on, yeah, um, an yeah. alpha nu. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but, so if you knew me, you would have known my father, but here you aren't making that connection real clearly, you know. And so he clarifies it. Now what, the other point is, what does the verb here mean? The gnosko verb. What does that mean? Give me a synonym for it, Miguel. Oh. If you had known me, you would have known the Father. And it's a synonym you find earlier in this narrative. Oh. Oh, I'll narrow it, narrow it for uh. you. <laughs> anyway, help him out. Oida. 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 No, no. 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 Uh, yeah, pistol. Oh, pistil. Yeah, yeah. 
because Thoreau has the, it, I mean, remember how we, we sometimes use this, in, I mean, John is very classic. Knowing is believing, or seeing is not believing, you know, you can, you can not see and yet believe. <clears throat> but knowing is a synonym for faith. So, if you knew me, namely if you believed who I am, uh, you, you would believe or know the Father, because you, you, every word I, I say is the Father's word, every action I do is the Father's action. Uh, and then he, he emphasizes, her, but from now on you know him and you have seen him, namely, I am helping you make this connection that you aren't just seeing me, the Son, as a poor substitute for the Father, but you are actually seeing and knowing, seeing and hearing the Father in everything that I'm saying and doing. And the ultimate way they're going to see the Father is what? This is right before it. This is the farewell narrative, so what's happening? The ultimate way they're going to see God in action, the Father in action, is through the Son's what? Yeah, the sacrifice of the Son is showing them the Father. It's almost like one might say, uh, and here the background is the sacrifice of Isaac, where the, fa the Father is willing to sacrifice the Son, only now the Father actually gives the Son over to be sacrificed. Uh, uh, the Lord will provide his pointing forward not just to the ram caught in the thicket, it's, it's pointing forward to, to what Christ would do, the, the sacrifice God would provide in, in the Son, who is the Lamb of God. You know, um, I'm trying to provide integration. Uh, um, Garrett's in John in just a little while. And so <laughs> he's shaking his head. He's putting all these things together in light of... <laughs> and Jeff had John last fall, so he's... he's uh, working on that integration too. Any any other questions with verses 6 and 7? Okay, and then verse 8, and, uh, keep on going then. Miguel? Uh, he said, uh, Philip said to you, to him, Lord, show, show us the Father. It is sufficient for us. Okay, what's the Old Testament background for this text? Moses. Yes. Very good, Miguel. What, what what chapter? What, what oh, it's Exodus. I don't know what chapter. Okay, this is one that Exodus. should be. A, if, anytime you study John, this should be in the front of your 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 the front burner. You should know it well. Garrett, what is it? Oh man. Pressure's on. Exodus <laughs> twenty or thirty? Is it thirty-two? Uh, Thirty. Yeah, close. Thirty-two. It's right after that. Thirty-three and thirty-four. 3320 is actually the key. Yes. Yeah, show us your glory, Moses says. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, this this little conversation we've had, Yahweh, this is fine, but I want to see you actually take on a a physical form. You know, this cloud business is okay, but I want to see even more. Show me your glory. Show me your tangibleness in a in a different way. Uh, and that's when the Lord passes by mm -hmm. and shows his backside. So he takes on an anthropomorphic form. That's the background for this, where, where um, Philip asks, and it's just, you know, it's sort of just as we saw earlier, Thomas is sort of setting up Jesus to be able to talk about this. Now Philip sets him up because he says, Lord, show us the Father, um, and that, you know, will, will suffice for us. Uh, and it just shows how they haven't gotten any of the teaching that really Jesus lays out in John 5. You know, to see the Father's, to see his works, or to see the Father's works. Or John uh, 10, to, to hear his words, or to hear the words of the Father. Um, to hear his voice is to hear the voice of the Father. Um, they haven't, they aren't getting it. And this is sort of the ultimate one might say slap in the face. Jesus has shown forth the Father's works. He's shown forth the Father's words. And, and now they're asking, we want to see the Father. 
And here's the, the short answer Jesus could have given. What am I? Chopped liver? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he basically um, comes across with a very, um, uh, I would say, a fairly confrontational response. You know, it, it's, it's pastoral, it's loving, but it's, it's somewhat confrontational. Now let's, verse 9 and 10, please, David. Uh, yes, sir. Translation. Uh, Jesus <clears throat> says to him, uh, So long a uh, time I have been with you, and you do not know me, Philip. Mm -hmm. um, the one having seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Okay. Now, we pray. I had mentioned this a few weeks ago, but I just want to stress this point again. At the beginning of the phrase that we looked at a few weeks, a few verses ago, ego I me, with the with the predicate. So I am the way, the truth, and the life. What's important about the ego I me's construction? Anyone? It mirrors Exodus. Okay, it mirrors the fact that at the end of the Pentateuch. And also, several places in Isaiah, that's the way Yahweh speaks. He says, um, Ego I me, or Ego I me, Ego I me, in the Septuagint. Mm -hmm. Or in the Hebrew, it's Ani Hu, or Ani Ani Hu, or Noki Hu. But it's a self disclosure formula. It's just, it's just, it is I, and there is no other God. And that, that formula is found in, in, in the Gospel of John. Before Abraham was, I am. I am. However, to use the formula with a predicate nominative isn't mean that that formula isn't sort of in the background. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's Jesus identifying himself as Yahweh, but then giving a characteristic. So, because he could just say, I mean. Why the ego I mean? Well, I think of the ego I mean is in part to, to kind of Call to mind. This is how Yahweh speaks. Ego I me. But here, I am the way, the truth, and the life is like Jesus saying, I am Yahweh, mm -hmm. and as Yahweh, I am the way to, to fellowship with Yahweh. I am the truth in the sense that you see um, uh, the revelation of God in and, 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 and what I do and what I say. And I am... Um, the life. So, you know, life is only found in Yahweh, and if it's found in me, I am Yahweh. But to, to use that predicate nominative construction that we see so often, I am the bread of life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, really is calling to mind Jesus identifying himself as Yahweh speaks, which he just says, it is I, um, ego I me. And we see it in the Gospel of John not only in the absolute form, but we also see it in these predicate nominative sayings. I think they are echoing. And the Exodus 3.14 is part of the background where Jesus, where the, the, uh, God explains the meaning of his name by saying, I am the one who is. Um, and you have ego I me as part of that phrase. Yeah. Okay, uh, then getting back to this text, um, so, you know, um, the one who has seen me, what's the, um, the tense of that, David, in verse 9? Uh -huh. The eo rak, uh, rakos. The heaven, that's the perfect. Yeah, and then you have the same thing in eo raken. Yeah. So, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. Why is the perfect tense important here, David? It shows a unrepetitive past sequence of events continuing to the per present, right? Yeah, so they have already seen Jesus, Jesus. Mm -hmm. so they have already seen in the Father, mm -hmm. the Father. So where have they seen the Father? In Jesus. Yeah, but where? Oh. Uh, in his ministry? And yeah, in every word that yeah. he has said and in every action he has done. And the Gospel of John has highlighted seven different key actions, 
and that goes to the climax with the with the raising of Lazarus. But you know, in those actions, you've seen the Father. Why? Because Jesus works are the works of the Father. In every word that you've heard, you've heard the words of the Father. Why? Because Jesus first, as the eternal Son, hears what the Father's saying and he speaks it forth. He's the ultimate prophet. You know, other prophets have to wait for Yahweh to speak to them. Jesus has this eternal fellowship with the Father. He can just speak any time because he's in communion with the Father and he reflects that in everything that he says. Um, so here you have, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. Now why is this so important for your pastoral ministry? What are you going to be revealing to people all the time? If you show them Jesus, you'll show them the Father. Yeah. And, and people want to have communion with the creator of this universe. But what's the key to having, having fellowship with the creator of this universe? Is to know Jesus. And you can know Jesus. Why? He actually was flesh and blood. He was here on this earth. He spoke. He, you saw his actions. We have them in the Gospels. Um, we have, so, and, and, and the Gospels tell us that every, every uh, action and word of God in the Old Testament, where God is seen and heard, our actions of the pre-incarnate Son. So you have a lot of re revelation through the Son. And if you have revelation through the Son, you know the Father, because all of his words and all of his, his deeds are, are revealing the works and the words of the Father. So, you know, Jesus isn't the second string quarterback. You know, to know him is to have, a, to, to, to uh, not have a substitute, a poor substitute for God, but to have uh, the revelation of God. Okay, let's uh, wrap it up then. Verses 10 and 11, please. Jordan? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Um, the words that I say to you um, are not from my authority or... Yeah, a better way to say that, just to translate it more literally, the words which I am speaking to you are not, I am not speaking from Eomo 2, from my... From my law. From myself. From myself, sorry. Yeah. Um, but the Father. Yes. Um, in me, um, the, the Father, the Father, what was it? Uh, and then you have the middle. Remains, the uh, Father word. remaining <clears throat> in me the, uh, does, does these works themselves. Or does yeah, the works themselves. does his, um, his works. Now, obviously, he just said words, but then he switched to works. But this is in John. He's constantly interconnection of his works are the works of the Father, his words are the words of the Father. And so Jesus is saying, basically, he doesn't speak his own words, and that the Father does his works through the Son. So if you've seen the Father, if you've seen the Son doing something, if you've heard the Son, you've heard the Father. And why is this so helpful? Because we've just, during the, uh, the Lenten season, Easter, Easter season, we've been focusing on what God has done in Jesus. And if we've seen that and heard that, we're not so, well, I have some idea of what God's like because Jesus is an agent for the Father. No, I know exactly what God's like because I've seen that God's actions in the Son. I've heard God's words through the Son. I know exactly who the God of Israel, who the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are because it's it's so clear in this flesh and blood Lord. If I know Jesus, I know the one true God. I know the Trinity. I know the Father. And Jordan, verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Um, and if not, believe according to these works, or the works. Yeah, yeah. And so he puts even more stress if we had to line up these two works and words of Jesus, what does he put more stress on? Yeah. And I think it's setting up the fact that he's going to show the ultimate work through his own sacrifice. So even if you are struggling with all of Jesus' words being the words of the Father, look at the works. You know, nobody else can do what he's doing. And so there is, both of them are important. Words, works. 
but uh, there is a little priority given the works. And then finally, the last two verses here, uh, uh, last three, Garrett, sure. just translate. Okay. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, um, he that believes in, uh, in me, um, the works which I do, that one also shall do, and um, greater, greater than, greater than these he shall do, mm -hmm. um, for I go to the Father. Yeah, this is the language of ascension. So you can, you know, if you're preaching this, you're going to kind of help point forward to the fact of the ascension. But it's not that he's leaving them; they're going to do greater th things than 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 this, what he has been doing. And what is that a reference to? I think it's a reference to the fact of what the church is going to accomplish. Namely, we're going to be proclaiming what Christ has done, and that's going to lead to the kind of uh, expansion to the, that the church has never experienced to this point, you know, during Jesus' earthly ministry. It's worldwide, global expansion. We're here 2,000 years later. Look at what's happened. Because of the earthly ministry of Jesus, what's happened through through the ministry uh, of the church. It's, you know, so many people have been brought in. And then verse 13 and 14. And um, whatever you ask in my name, uh, this I shall do, mm -hmm. um, in order that the uh, Father be glorified in the Son. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, the conditional sentence at the end. If, um, for if... Uh, but if you ask of me in my name, I will do it. Okay, what's this emphasis in, in my name? This is so often used for, for prayer, right? We say, John 14 says, ask something in the name of Jesus, so I just throw it on every prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. But what does it actually mean to ask something in the name of Jesus? It's in the Trinity. Okay, uh, Jordan? Uh, in what sense? Well, I mean, what, is, what is the name of Jesus? What does that phrase mean? Ask something in my name. What is the name Jesus is talking about here? Well, this whole time he's saying, I am in the Father, the Father is in me. So this is his full name. And I'm, what is his full name? The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, but what is the name shared by the Father, the Son, and the Holy yeah, Spirit? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say this is asking something. What's the real key? It's not using the phrase. Otherwise, you could have any unbeliever waving that over his request. I ask it in the name of Jesus, much like you know, Simon Magnus tried to do this. You know, oh, in the name of Jesus, that's, that's my key magic wand. And I'll wave that over, and then it, you know, something will happen. It, what's important is not that we use the, name, the phrase in the name of Jesus. What's important is that we believe, when we ask something, we believe who Jesus is. We ask in the faith that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Yahweh, that his name is the name shared by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is what Jordan was getting at. Uh, and so when Jesus says, ask things in my name, it's asking in the belief that Jesus is not just an agent of God. He is none other than Yahweh. He is the, the Word made flesh. And, and so asking things in that confident faith that uh, when I um, pray um, through Jesus, um, my, my prayers are heard and answered uh, because I believe Jesus is none other than God. Yeah, yeah, Lord and God. Okay, um, great discussion. Sorry to run you over a little bit. And uh, let's close with the benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you didn't get the worksheet for the, the Sunday after Easter done, just turn it in Monday. Okay, Miguel, you gave me yours last week. Several of you gave me this this week. Uh, and then uh, last week is our last Monday. So let's all be here. Wrap it up. Okay? Thanks Thank you so much. much.